So let's get down to some uh, vector drawables. Um, so um, I usually don't like the, the whole um, sort of vanity slide thing, but the one interesting thing about that, this is my Twitter on here. If you don't follow me on Twitter, um, you might want to, because I'm going to be live tweeting throughout the course of this presentation. So as we go, there'll be some tweets that will post the links to some of the articles that support the, give you extra information about the stuff we're going to talk about. Um, and my Twitter is Mark I. Allison. That is an I, not an L. It's Allison with two L's. It's Mark with a K, not a C. And there's no Q's or Z's or anything in there. Um, but yeah, if you want to follow me, you might get some, uh, some tweets as we go. Um, so we're going to talk vector drawables. Um, now, you have to forgive me. I'm happy to come on after John and Nicola. They turned my head to jelly with some of the cool stuff they just announced. So if I'm struggling here, it's because how do you speak after taking all that up in? That was uh, quite something. Um, but yeah, I am a big fan of vector drawables. Um, I love vector drawables a lot. Oh, no, I've got stuff all over the floor as well. Um, and vectors have been around since API 21. And if my clicker works, there we go. And they're pretty damn good. I like vectors a lot. Um, vector Studio is part of Android Studio. It allows you to import vectors and do stuff with vectors. And when vectors were first launched, it was... Uh, it wasn't great. Uh, there were uh, third-party tools which were better for importing vectors and getting them into the vector format. But it has come along leaps and bounds. It is really, really good now. It imports most things, and it does as good a job. I, I recently had a really complex vector that I thought, I'll try it, but I don't expect much. It didn't come in perfectly. I will grant you that, because it was a really complex vector. But it was every bit as good as Sketch managed to import it. And Sketch's whole reason for being is a vector editor. So that was pretty good. Um, and it was added to support library 23.2.0. And that is important because it means we're backwardly compatible. Backwards compatibility is good. It also means that some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today is the stuff that has been added since API 21. There's been some good stuff come in that is really useful. Um, and if you use the support library, you get that all backported. So there's going to be a sort of resounding theme through here that you should use the support library. Um, you'll throw find that in a number of cases when we talk fragments and stuff like that, which we're not going to do in this talk, but fragments are being deprecated in P, so you should use it as a support library instance. But it, as a general rule of thumb, if you have a framework version of anything and a support library version, use the support library and you'll get fixes backported, you'll get releases, you'll get a much more uh, consistent behavior across different API levels. So we're going to start talking fill windings. Does anyone already know about fill windings? A couple of hands, but not many, so that's pretty good. But um, I haven't written this bit of the presentation yet. There's someone that does know them. Do you want to come? To them? Okay. Um, fill windings uh, bit me quite badly. Um, quite early on in the days of that, uh, I can see John shaking his head here. <laughs> um, they bit me quite badly because I had this weird problem. A designer gave me a design, and this is a really simplified version. That what he gave me looked like what is on the right, the sort of donut shape, and it looked great in Sketch where he created it. It looked great when you open the SVG file in uh, Chrome, but as soon as we dropped it into Android, we got a filled in circle. And it turns out that fill windings were to blame. 
So to work out why, let's explain a little bit what film windings are. So here are these two vectors. The, these are the path elements used to draw these. The path data, you would think, would be different. But if we actually compare them, the only thing that's different here is this fill type attribute. We've got either non-zero or even odd. And these are the fill windings. And just by specifying these different fill windings, we get these two rather different things of identical path data, which is a bit weird. Fill windings are a rule by which any given pixel is determined to be inside the path or outside the path. So if it falls within the path, it should be filled in with the fill color. If it falls outside the path, it should not be filled. Um, for something that obviously falls outside the entire uh, bounding box of the path, it's clear that shouldn't be filled. But what about what happens right in the middle of this shape, this donut shape? So let's have a look at how this shape is constructed. So the path data here is we have two circles. We have an outer circle, which is drawn anti-clockwise. Uh, I won't go into the detail of this. We'll cover a little bit more about drawing curves a bit later on. And then we have a second path, or subpath within this same path object that's another anti-clockwise circle that's drawn inside. And so this was the shape I was got. Uh, I was given. The previews all looked like a donut, but I got this blob. And I said, I want a donut. And I know what you're thinking, looking at me, that's not the first time I've ever said that. Um, but then I uh, teamed up with my designer and we tried to hash this out and work out what was going on. So, Let's first take a look at these two rules. So the even-odd rule, this is a way of determining for any given pixel, is it inside or outside the path? So if we take a point right in the dead center of the circle, and it could be sort of anything within the, the, the inside circle of these two that this same rule applies to, what we do is we move to the edge of the canvas, and it can be in any direction we like and we count the number of times we pass across a path. So here, we're just moving horizontally. We cross the path once here, then a second time here, and then we hit the edge of the canvas. So we've counted twice that we've crossed the path here. The even odd rule, as you now may begin to work out, is if we pass across the path an even number of times, then it's deemed to be outside. If we cross an odd, number is inside. So in this case we've crossed twice so it's even, so it's outside the path, so it won't be filled when we come to, to draw this particular pixel. Um, and if you think, if we position ourselves actually outside of the, the outer path as well, that's going to hit the, uh, the boundary zero times, and zero is technically in this case an, odd, an even number, so we're outside the path. If we move to this point between the two circles. If we go this way, we cross the path once. Then we hit the canvas. So that's a, an odd number. And so this is deemed to be inside the path. So this particular pixel should be painted with the fill color. If we go the other direction, so it doesn't matter which direction we go, this uh, rule still applies. We cross the path once, then twice, then three times. So it's still an odd number when we hit the canvas. So when we then come to fill this shape, we get the donut. So then we come to the non-zero rule. Now this is a very similar idea that we, we're drawing an imaginary line to the edge of the canvas. And in this case, when we come to the first path, it's actually the direction that the path is crossing us in. So if you imagine you're crossing a one-way street, you, it's which direction the traffic will come. And this is a bit like crossing the road, only a lot safer. Um, you, I don't know of anyone that's ever been hit by a bus trying to render vector drawables, but there probably is an exception to that rule. Um, so in this case, we check the direction that we're crossing the path. And if it's coming from 
in an anti-clockwise direction, we increment the path. So here we count one, we hit the second path, and that's going anti-clockwise as well, so we increment again. So we get a count of two when we hit the edge of the canvas. This is called the non-zero rule. So this is a non-zero number, so we are deemed to be inside the path if we are non-zero. And you can see that if we draw this point in any direction, it's always going to be non-zero. And so when we fill this, we get this filled circle. And this was basically the problem we were having. We were seeing this kind of thing when we expected uh, the other behavior, the donor. And what was happening was Sketch was working in the even odd rule. And in API 21, there was no concept of fill windings. It was hard coded internally as non zero. But there was a fix. Because of understanding this thing about path directions, I asked the designer, could you reverse the, uh, the way that we actually draw this inner circle? And so when we then come there, uh, draw our imaginary line, in this case, we cross the path is coming clockwise, so we decrement the, uh, the counter, so minus one. Here it's then coming anti-clockwise, so we increment, and we get a value of zero when we hit the boundary. And so then, just by changing the direction of that inner path using the non-zero rule, we get a donut. And everyone's happy when they've got a donut. And so that is, it took some working out. It took uh, working with a, a friendly designer who was happy to tinker about with stuff that I suggested and the vain hope that it might uh, fix something. But in the end, it did. And we actually got what we needed. And he then learned that if he constructed his paths in a nice way, then we could get exactly the behavior we wanted. And he quickly learned those rules. And uh, we were golden after that. So in summary, in API 21, we only got non-zero, and that was hard-coded. You couldn't do anything about it. But in API 24, we got fill type, which is this new attribute. And we could then specify either non-zero or even odd. So if I'd have hit the same problem after uh, uh, API 24, we could have fixed it in this way. But that's great unless you're targeting MinSDK24. But it was added to support library 26.0.0. So if you are wanting to get this kind of behavior, the rule is use the support library. I told you we'd come back to this. So the second thing, this is another thing that was added uh, since API 21. Um, and this is particularly useful for animated vectors, is we have these weird things called uh, inline complex XML resources, which is a bit of a mouthful and is a bit weird when you consider that what it, it's all about is making things more manageable, and so it's given a really long name. Yeah, like that. Um, and what they are is, Animated vectors require a minimum of three files. You have a vector drawable file, which is the, the vector that we're going to animate. We then have some kind of animator file, which is usually an object animator or something like that, which is going to animate one of the parameters on the path data or one of the, uh, the groups or something like that. And then we have the animated vector itself, which is kind of a mapping file that links this animator with a specific element within our vector drawable. And so having these three files, and that's the simplest possible configuration you can have, because if you're animating more than one thing, you need a separate animator for each thing you're animating. So it's the number of separate items you're animating plus two is the number of different files you actually need. Um, and this is sometimes a problem if you're trying to keep your code all together and manageable and easy to maintain. And so this thing was brought in called inline complex uh, XML resources. And they work like this. 
you first need to add a new annotation, uh, a new namespace, which is AAPT. Now, some of you may be aware of AAPT and see that in build tools and stuff like that. And this is an uh, Android asset packaging tool, which is another lovely mouthful, which is always difficult to remember. Um, and Mark's drinking game for tonight when we're at the par after party is, if you're in a group of people, you have a competition to see whoever can say uh, Android asset packaging tool 10 times in a row the fastest. Whoever does has to chug their beer. And you keep going until someone falls over. But it becomes a self-leveling game that the better you are at it, the more drunk you get quicker. So it has its own built-in handicap. So uh, if anyone wants a game of that, then seek me out at the, the party tonight and we'll, we'll play. Um, so AAPT is this uh, part of the build process that basically takes uh, all your lovely resources and does some stuff with them. Um, it sort of converts them to binary XML and it builds your table of uh, resource IDs and makes sure they're all uh, unique and lots of other jiggery pokery. But what this does is this allows us to sort of hook it into our process a little bit and we, we leverage its behavior to do some uh, special source for us. And what it does is allows us to create custom uh, attributes or inline attributes, I should say. So normally in an animated vector drawable, the animated vector uh, element will have a drawable attribute where you reference another resource. In this case, we're using AAP, AAPT ATTR to specify an attribute for the parent element. So in this case, for the animated vector element. And the name here is Android Drawable. And you can see that in the animated vector above, uh, up here, we don't actually have uh, a drawable uh, attribute. And normally, we'd get a lint warning because of this. We'd get an error because it's a required uh, attribute. But this allows us to inline it. So the body of this is actually just that vector file that we've cut and pasted in. So we're actually, rather than having this as a separate file, we can drag it in here and we can use it to our heart's content and everyone's happy. And you can mix and match these because if you look at the uh, uh, target, this is actually referencing uh, an animation here, I've sort of shortened it and things, but uh, that is still using the, the old syntax. So you can mix and match this to your heart's content. And what actually happens at build time is AAPT recognizes this. It actually splits this out into a separate file. Um, and what actually gets built into your APK is actually pretty much the same as if you did it as separate files. But this just allows you to organize it in your code base in single files. There are times where this is really useful. There are times where you might want to avoid it. If you're using the same animations all throughout your code base, you probably want to have them in their own separate files because if you need to tweak that, you just do it in the one place. But if you've got just a, a single animator that you can inline here or a single vector that you can inline here, then you can do that and it just makes it a little bit easier to maintain. So these were added to AAPT uh, 2.2, so it's been around a while. It allows you to bundle up multiple resources and it's not just limited to animated vectors, you can actually do this in any XML file where you're referencing another resource. You, you could inline it using this technique. It gets broken up during the build into separate components. Some of the downsides is you have limited auto-suggest. So where you might create a vector object in Android Studio, you'll get all this nice auto-complete and stuff. When you have an inline resource, it doesn't tend to work as well and you sort of have to, it's often quite easier to create it as a separate file, get that working and then cut and paste it in. And the other, it's not really a major thing, but it can cause a slight APK bloat because if you 
inline the same thing in a number of places, it's going to split it out into separate files. As far as I'm aware, there's no optimization to detect any duplication in there and uh, optimize that, but they're only small anyway, so it's probably not a big deal. And if you have got a number of instances of the same thing, as I say, for maintainability, you probably want to use a single copy anyway, so you probably, uh, it's probably a smell that you're doing it wrong if you're having to, to uh, do this in a number of places. So the final main thing we'll talk about, and I'm uh, going to have to speed up because I'm, as I say, I gabble a lot. Uh, we're going to talk about gradients. Um, gradients have long been um, a problem because I'll let you into a secret. Um, designers like gradients. Um, even with modern uh, flat uh, design languages, they still like their gradients. They l use them in very, very subtle little ways. And they, uh, you can often uh, not realize that gradients are there. Um, you probably, it, it's not always good, uh, easy to spot on uh, a projector screen, but I use a subtle gradient on the background of my slides that probably no one even notices it's there, but I do, so it makes me feel better. And designers are much the same. And so we got these wonderful vector drawables and they start, oh yeah, we want to create all these. And then they create this lovely uh, SVG file that's got a nice gradient in it and you say, ah. Um, by the way, we don't have uh, uh, gradient support in there. And their faces, they drop. It makes designers really, really sad. And we don't like sad designers. We like to keep our designers happy. But now we can, because we have gradients. There are three types of gradients. The most obvious one is a simple linear gradient. So this draws from one color to another in a straight line. And we create these with a gradient element. And you can use these in a vector drawable. You can use uh, an inline resource to uh, define a fill color or something like that in this precise way and inline it. And how this works is you first give it a type of linear. That's a surprise. It's a linear gradient. There's a clue there somewhere. You need to give it a, a start position and color. So in this case, we give it a start position of 0, 0, so that point at the top of the, uh, the square. And we give it a start color. Now in this case, the actual color value, the start and end colors, are identical. All I'm changing is the alpha here so that we get uh, the, the background showing through. But, um, you can do sort of full color transitions and what have you. You then define an end point, an end color. So here the end point is the bottom corner. And these two points themselves aren't important. It's the direction of the line between them that controls the direction of the gradient. So you could actually put these two points anywhere along here or expand it off into infinity in either direction. And you would still get this exact same gradient, providing they had the same orientation with respect to each other. So this, if the direction of this line doesn't change, the gradient that gets drawn doesn't change. But if you move one of the points, so if we were to move one of those points so that we're drawing a diagonal line, then we'll get a diagonal gradient. The second type we have is a radial gradient. So this draws from the center to the outside and transitions between two colors. So we create these by giving it a type of radial. Again, there's a clue there somewhere. These are actually simpler uh, to produce than uh, a linear because there's actually fewer attributes. We first have to define the center point. So this is the point where the start color is going to be. And this uh, square is 100 by 100, so if we create a center point at 50-50, that's going to be dead center of our square. We then create the, uh, the radius of the gradient. So in this case, this white circle is the radius that we're going to draw our gradient to. And so it draws from the start color to the end color, and it hits the end color, 
at that radius point. And if you look into these corners, these are actually uniform colors because they then appear beyond the endpoint that we've de defined. If you want to go full edge, edge to edge, you need to make your gradient big, bigger, and a little bit of trigonometry gives us a value of 70.71. If you make it that value, you're, you won't actually hit the edge of the gradient here, but you will just as you hit the corner. Hopefully you can see that with uh, as the, the fill color matches the, the, out, the stroke color there and there, we're actually going fully to the edge. Third and final type of gradient we have is a sweep gradient. Um, so this actually draws a, a circular sweep around the, the endpoint. So we start at one color and we sweep around and finish at the end color. This is simpler still. We give it a type of sweep. Again, nothing strange going on there. We also give it uh, a center so that you can see clearly where the center point there is. Um, and then we just give it a start and end color. So this looks a bit raw because starting and ending abruptly like this isn't generally a way you'd use these. You'd more likely use them like this where you actually go from a start color through a middle color and then back to the start color. So you get this sort of smooth, much smoother transition. And you can do this quite simply by, rather than giving a start and end color in here, which you can still use start and end and interchange the, these techniques, but you can have these items. Now these are set in various color points within the gradient. So here we start at zero, which is the start point. So here we start at our alpha transparent color through the midpoint, which is 0 0.5 offset. And that goes through our full green. And then we go back to the start color at 1.0, which is the end point. So these step uh, offsets are between zero and one. And at the start, and zero is the start, one is the end. And by doing this, we can actually, uh, you can add a number of these step points and you can actually change where the start position is by actually shifting things around and you can add a uh, full rainbow spectrum if you want and uh, you uh, really want to uh, freak the users out and you can go really psychedelic on them and stuff like that. But this is really powerful. It's a simple API, but you can really do a lot with it. So in summary, Gradients, they were added in API 24. This is a gotcha, sweep is not supported in SVG. So the SVG format doesn't support sweep gradients. Now this can be a bit of a problem because tools like Sketch do. So I discovered this by, I was playing with these I created some gradients in Sketch, I exported them all, I imported them into, uh, uh, exported them as SVG, pulled them up into Android Studio, and uh, the sweep gradient just wasn't there. And I was then trying to debug what had gone wrong, and then we're, it was only after a lot of head scratching, I actually went back and opened the SVG in Chrome, only to find that, yeah, that was not there either. Um, and it turns out, after some uh, checking, that uh, SVG just doesn't support this kind of gradient. So if you have a designer that wants to use this, you will need to sit with them and be nice to them and try and understand what they're trying to do. Pull their design across and then maybe try and recreate the sweep that they've created yourself manually because there's not really an easy way around it because it's not a problem with vectors, it's not a problem with Android Studio, it's an issue with SVG which is a third party solution which sits in the middle of the design tools and the developer tools. So yeah, that's a bit of a problem but learn about sweet gradients and you can uh, get over it. And the nice thing is they've been added to the support library, so we no longer see, need to look at the forlorn faces of our designers when we tell them that, uh, that uh, gradients are no longer supported. And so 
use the support library. So we'll finish, there's been sort of quite a lot of dryish theory, so we'll try and finish with something a little lighter and a little bit more practical of how you can do some nice stuff with uh, vectors just by building uh, some quite simple animations. So I toiled day and night on these slides. And so I decided to try and pick, depict that in uh, an animation. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so how do we create something like this? Uh, we'll, we'll actually go through the full phases. Uh, I'll, I, I'll tell you a bit later how you can actually grab the full source to this and stuff like that. Um, but we start off with the background. The background is a square, and at daytime it's a light blue, at nighttime it's a dark blue. And we can create a simple color animator that's going to transition between one value to another. And this will do, just do a, 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 an ARGB interpolation between the two values and animate between those two colors. Um, the next thing we do is we draw a line. This is a very simple line between two points. We color it yellow. We then animate it. We use what's called a trim path animation. If you're not familiar with trim path, trim path is a really nice way of animating stuff. It takes a fixed path and will just draw a part of it. And you can do a trim path on the start, you can draw a trim path on the end, and you can do it on the middle, and you can get all kinds of nice effects. Um, a common thing is if you've got a, an outline of an object, if you animate the trim path from zero to one, it will draw the outline for you. Uh, Roman Guy did uh, some nice stuff about this a few years ago, before vectors were around even, and showed how to do it all programmatically. But you can do this really, really cheaply using vectors. And so here we're just animating the trim path, and you can see how we're doing this uh, in relation to the day to night transition on the, the background. On top of that, we then animate the color as well. So we're doing two things with the color. As well as changing the color value, so we've got yellow there, which is the daytime color. There's a gray value, which is gonna tie in with the color that we go when we color the moon. Uh, and we're also animating the alpha. So the first two digits are the alpha, the transparency. So it's going from uh, a yellow to a completely transparent gray at the end. And so it appears to both fade out, but it's also fading to gray as well because it will tie in with something else that's happening later on. So this, if you hadn't guessed, is this is one of the rays around the sun. And we shrink it to real size. And then we add 11 more. And then we get the rays of the sun. We then add those all within a group. Groups are useful because they then allow you to apply, apply animations across everything. So in this case, we can now apply a rotation to the whole group. So we're just rocking this uh, back through 30 degrees. And so we just get this nice little twist animation going on. We can then scale as well. So we're just growing this to 1.4 times its actual size. So we see it grow as it, so it seems to sort of spiral out a little way. And then when we apply this uh, trim path and the color on top of that, you can see how it makes our, the rays of the sun sort of just seem to, to float away. So we're almost there. We've just got the easy bit of the sun to moon left. And it's not quite that easy. Um, we need to have a little lesson in drawing curves. Um, this is all SVG data. So this is SVG path data. And it's actually quite easy to draw a circle. We use a thing called an arc. And how we do this is, first of all, we do a move. So this M command, this is going to move our pen on the canvas to where we're going to start drawing. So we're moving it to that point there. We then have A, which stands for arc. 
An arc is a section of the outline of a circle. And that's exactly what we need here, because the sun is a circle. And, uh, but we don't want to draw all of it. We can easily draw the circle in one pass, and then we get the sun. But then it makes it difficult to draw, uh, to animate that to the moon. So we actually only want, at this stage, to draw the part of the circle that's common to both. So that's the first uh, 280 degrees, in this case, of the circle in an anti-clockwise direction. So on our arc command, the first thing we need to do is specify the end point. And these are actually the last two uh, parameters to this arc command here. And that is this point down here. The remainder of these is controlling how we're going to link those two points up. The first thing is we need to define the radius of the circle that is going to join these two points. And that's done with these two dimensions here, the 249s. You can create ellipses using the arc command. And you could do that by giving a different x radius and y radius, and that will give an oval or an ellipse. In this case, we want a perfect circle, so these are the same. So this is going to be completely symmetrical. And there are actually two circles that can pass through both of these points on the canvas, if we're drawing in, a, in two dimensions, that is. I, I should, uh, in case someone says, ah, but there are exceptions to that if we go to three dimensions. But in two dimensions, there's two possible circles that can pass through this. And we can find the center of those circles by drawing a radius of 49, uh, a circle of 49, uh, radius, 49 pixel radius around each of these. Uh, if my clicker works. There we go. And so there's two circles of radius 49 around each of those. And where these two circles cross, we get two points. Now those two points if we draw a circle of radius 49 around them, they pass through both of those points. So there's the proof that there are two circles that pass through both of those points. And the remaining three parameters in the middle here, these 0, 1, 0, those three control what part of both of those circles we can use to draw the arc we want. So the first one we can actually ignore. Uh, if we're drawing an ellipse, we can use this first parameter to rotate it around the x-axis so we can uh, offset the ellipse and we can uh, create different ellipse values. But we're drawing a perfectly symmetrical circle, so we can ignore this. So only two, down, uh, only two parameters left. And both of these can be one or zero. So we're on the home stretch here. So the third of these, I know I'm doing this in a weird order, but I'm hoping it makes it easier to understand. The third of these controls which of the circles we want to draw a part of. If we were to set this to one, it's going to draw the highlighted circle there. But we don't actually want that one. We want the other one. So we set it to zero, and we're left with this circle. So the final argument we have here is this one. Now, there are actually two arcs here. There's the shorter one that runs around there, and there's the longer one which goes around there. We want this longer one. So the shorter one would be if we set this to zero. We get the longer one if we set to one. And by we finally have this final arc command, and we get this 280 degree circle. So sorry if that was quite long winded, but hopefully you've got a, a, at least a bit of an understanding about how, what all these parameters are and how you can use them to create an arc. So you will have seen when we had those two circles, we sort of had all the components to draw the, this final part of the circle. We can either just do another arc using the similar sort of parameters and just use, just draw in that short uh, section. Or we can use the other circle to draw a, a, a convex, uh, sorry, a concave section in there and get our present moon, which you certainly could do, but then we couldn't get the animation we want. So instead, we use a cubic bezier. 
this is a different type of curve that we can draw using SVG. Now, technically, a cubic Bezier cannot create a mathematically perfect section of a circle. That is simple maths. But you can get a pretty close approximation. And a close enough approximation to fool the human eye is all that's necessary. It's all smoke and mirrors. We cheat. We can cheat. As long as it looks close enough, we can live with using a cubic bezier here instead of an arc. A cubic bezier will start drawing at the same point that we left off. So we finished drawing at this point of the arc. So that is where our pen is now positioned. So that is now automatically the start point. The final two arguments here is the end point. So this is actually back where we started. We want to close this circle off. We then have two further coordinates, which are the start control point, which are these two. And that is positioned just there. And then we have the end control point, which is positioned just there, and is these final two parameters. And the way these work is, if you imagine we're we're walking along this path that we want to draw. As we start off from the start point, we'll be walking directly towards the start control point here. And that will be pulling us completely as we leave the start point. But as we begin to move away from the start point, we'll, be begin, we'll begin to be influenced by the end control point. And the further along the path we go, the more we'll be influenced by that and the less by the start point. So by the time we reach the end point of the curve, we'll be walking directly away from the end control point. There's also strengths you can do use by moving them further away, but that's the essence of it. And so if we draw that, again, if my clicker works, there we go, we get something like that, which looks pretty close to the final section of the curve we want. But what we can now do is we can animate this. The start and end point do not change. But if we animate the control points, just by moving them uh, in straight lines, we actually pull this curve in and out. So again, it's been a long way getting here, but you can see that by understanding how to draw these certain curves and then animate them, we can get really quite a complex uh, animation that looks really smooth. So. Uh, there's a lot of work going on under the surface to get to this point, and sometimes we need to work a little harder to make something look effortless. So we finally do another color transition on this. So this is transitioning from the yellow to this gray color that we spoke about earlier that the rays are going to. And then finally we put it all together and we get to here, which is the sun transitioning to the moon. Um, and that's just about it, but I, for those that haven't seen me speak before, I offer an apology at this point, um, because there are no slides to give you. I'm not going to share my slides. The reason being, there just are no slides. Um, my presentation software is actually an Android app. It's running on a pixel book. It's a native Android app. And so all of the slides that you've seen are Android layouts. So they're all done in constraint layout. So thanks to John and Nico. Uh, all of the animations you've seen rendered here are actual animated vectors rendering in real time. So these aren't GIFs I've captured. You're seeing those render real time. So if they look smooth, that's because they're rendering smoothly. Um, and animated vectors do that. That's one of the things that's really nice about them. Um, and they're all vectors on there. You know, it's vectors. There's all the slide transitions are using uh, the transitions API and uh, constraint layout and moving stuff around. And it just uh, makes it really easy to put stuff like this together. There's a blog series. Now, hopefully, uh, if I stay connected to the Wi-Fi and the tweets work, 
um, then there will have been some links go out and there will have been a link go out to a, a blog post uh, I wrote about this and explains a bit about how it works. And it's open source. There is an open source version of this. It doesn't have stuff like the live tweeting and uh, a few of the, the niceties like that. But it does have all of the slide source here. It has all of these animations that you see. You can go in there and you can grab the source code. You can play with it. You can tinker with it. And that's the way to really get to know these and get the best out of them is to actually play with animations and most of all, enjoy them. That's it from me. I uh, hope you have a great rest of the day. Uh, I also have stickers. I do have a few styling Android pins as well. So if you want some swag, come and grab me. I, I don't buy or we can play the drinking game later on, whatever you prefer. <laughs> Thanks very much.